The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. We always enjoy welcoming a first-time guest to the Volpe Report, and such is the case today with Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, the Honorable Austin Davis. We also enjoy interviewing historical figures who break glass ceilings. And Lieutenant Governor Davis is the youngest Lieutenant Governor in the country and the first black Lieutenant Governor in Pennsylvania history. Just last week, we had the Speaker of the House of Representatives of Pennsylvania, Joanna McClinton, who was the first black woman to hold such a high post in the House of Representatives. Governor Davis grew up in a working family from McKeesport, Pennsylvania, a former steel town near Pittsburgh. His mom was a hairdresser for more than 40 years, and his dad was a union bus driver. At age 16, believe it or not, Austin began his public service career starting a youth advisory council with the mayor in McKeesport and a youth gun violence prevention program in his high school. This was the result of a shooting near his home in their neighborhood, and he unfortunately saw the results of gun violence when it came to his doorstep. Governor Davis went on to receive his degree in political science at the University of Pittsburgh, becoming the first in his family to receive a bachelor's degree. He then went to work for a personal friend of mine and a numerous guest on this show, Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald. In 2018, Austin was elected to the House of Representatives, representing the Mon Valley. His meteoric rise culminated with his election to become the historic Lieutenant Governor in 2022. In addition to presiding over the Senate of Pennsylvania, Governor Davis chairs the Board of Pardons and is the chair of the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Council. And particularly relevant to today's show, he serves as chair of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. He is a resident of Allegheny County and he and his wife Blair together recently welcomed their first child, a little girl. We welcome him to today's show. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful, informative, controversial, the area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Lieutenant Governor, thank you for joining The Volpe Report. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say, because you're my audience has already heard your wonderful resume and credentials, but I think it's it's rather historic that on back to back weeks, we have had a Joanna McClinton, the first African-American woman ever to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And if I'm correct, you're the first African-American Pennsylvanian male to be a Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania. So you're breaking glass ceilings and congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm also the youngest Lieutenant Governor in the country right now, so. Uh, wow, um, I knew you were the youngest, I think in Pennsylvania ever, but also the country. Well, well, yes. dub, double congratulations. It's, uh, it's our honor to, uh, to have, uh, I love to be able to report, uh, like also in the past couple of years, I'm sure a, a man you know very well, I've gotten to know and respect very well, first African-American, Tim DeFore, as our Auditor General of Pennsylvania. And in Scranton, we had uh, Paige Gephardt Cognetti, who I know you've met in your travels, yes. the first woman in the history of Scranton to be mayor of Scranton. So it's always great in this show to announce historical achievements. So congratulations, Governor. Thank you. Hopefully it serves as a, a point of pride for all Pennsylvanians and inspires the next generation of leaders to step up and join public service. Well. There's no question about it. So let's talk about uh, a couple of things. As I pointed out to uh, the speaker last week in a couple of her initiatives, talking about gun violence, talking about law enforcement, talking about the need for recruiting police officers, you know, that had been, uh, frankly, I believe a major weak spot for Democrats going back to 2020 and the year 2022 cycle, that that became a Republican talking point. And now there could be no question of your leadership her leadership as the speaker 
And in fact, I pointed out to her, she would do better to be the national democratic spokesperson on the issue of crime and, and recruiting police officers for the democratic party. Because honestly, the white house hasn't hit the message properly to me at this point, they haven't hit it. And, uh, you guys are hitting it here in Pennsylvania. So with that as a background, talk about your, a couple, two major initiatives right now. There's others, but your, your efforts to rec recruit police officers in Pennsylvania and the issue of gun violence. Why we yeah, need police no. officers. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So, you know, I was really privileged when I became lieutenant governor uh, that the governor appointed me to chair the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And I asked for that uh, because I got my start in public service after an act of gun violence in my neighborhood. Uh, that was something that was really jarring to me and really inspired me to do something about it and to make sure that my community was safe. And that work has really put me on the path to be Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor now. And the governor and I firmly believe that Pennsylvanians have the right to be safe and feel safe in their communities. And so we've been doing a ton of work to take on gun violence, but also to support law enforcement and recruit police officers. We've been facing a recruitment and retention crisis here in Pennsylvania. We have over 400 uh, vacant law enforcement positions here in the Commonwealth that the governor and I are working every day to drive out resources to help law enforcement agencies fill those gaps. So for example, we awarded $2 million to help fill the 400 vacancies for law enforcement across Pennsylvania uh, through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And those funds have been going to law enforcement departments all across the Commonwealth. But we've also recognized that it's gonna take a comprehensive approach to deal with gun violence and public safety. It's gonna take recruiting and retaining police officers but it's also going to take investing in violence intervention programs and community-based organizations that are doing the work in every community every day to make sure that they're safe. I'm proud that the governor and I have proposed a $100 million plan to take on gun violence here in Pennsylvania. Last year, we drove out $40 million in resources uh, to help tackle the epidemic of gun violence. Uh, and that's going to be funding community-based organizations, supporting uh, uh, law enforcement. It's also going to be investing in after school programs so that we know young people have a place, a safe place to go when they when their school day ends to make sure uh, that they have the opportunity to succeed. And so uh, it's gonna take a comprehensive approach, but I'm really proud uh, to be leading this charge on behalf of our administration. I did recently did a show on the gang violence and the proliferation of gangs in the Northeast Pennsylvania, as well as in Scranton specifically, we have a gang problem in Scranton. So we did a show on that, a special show, and one of the issues we addressed was that they recruit kids flat out that aren't involved in extracurricular and after-school activities because they have nothing to do. Many of them go right. home, they call them turnkey kids because you have two parents at work that, 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 you know, they're left to their own devices, so to speak. So, you know, I was particularly intrigued since the, uh, uh, the uh, trooper, Pennsylvania trooper, station commander that was on that show and in charge of the gang task force in the Northeast had talked about that as an issue that they have found in their studies and in their investigations. It was confirmed by your former colleague, Senator Marty Flynn, that that's what he sees, as well as a prosecutor, Lackawanna County District Attorney, uh, uh, Brian Gallagher. So with all that being, you know, it was particularly happy, I guess, particularly grateful that you could do this because you're you're hitting a subject that now I just talked about with the speaker last week, a special show dedicated to it. And voila, you're on, on television now talking about your after school initiative and how important that, how will that exactly work in your, you know, in a perfect so, world? Yeah. So perfect world, we proposed a, a little over $11 million this year to fund after school programs through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Uh, and we really view it as a way to help curb youth violence in our communities to make sure that young people have an opportunity to uh, to engage in some positive activity. Uh, these funds would fund organizations like the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, uh, after school programs, whether it's the, uh, offered by the local school district or a community based organization. These it's deeply personal to me because I, I was a Boys and Girls Club kid growing up. Uh, my my parents, my dad's a union bus driver. My mom's a hairdresser. They worked hard. Uh, they had to work. You know, I got off at 2.30 at school. Uh, it provided a safe place, a, a constructive place for me 
to, to hang with my friends, to play sports, but also learn uh, how to mature as a teenager uh, and to, to make sure I was on top of my schoolwork. And so it, it provides valuable resources. And right now we're not funding those programs. Uh, Chuck, if you think about when you were a kid, think about those YMCA's, Boys and Girls Club, Police Athletic Leagues, all those things. Those aren't available to young people today. Uh, in in a country that has as many resources as we do, we should be investing in our young people. We should be investing in after school programs. The governor and I uh, made a historic investment last year in public education here in Pennsylvania. We're gonna we're redoubling our efforts this year on our budget proposal uh, because these young people are our future, uh, and we have to give them positive and constructive ways to spend their time. And uh, ultimately, that will benefit all of us. It seems like we're struggling to find programs for young people. And I think the governor and I are sending a message that we want to invest in young people. And we view this $11 million as like the baseline, the beginning uh, of where our investments will be and not the end in our young people. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, governor, we are going to take a, a short commercial break uh, and then come right back uh, after just one message. And then we'll go to the second part. I want to talk a little bit about the budget and some of your other initiatives. We'll be right All back. Right. Now there's more places you can see the Volpe Report. Watch every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. on Fox 56. Or watch on YouTube at the Volpe Report. More ways to watch. Still the same premier public affairs show dedicated to the topics that matter most to Pennsylvanians. Welcome back again, Governor. And now we're going to get to the second part of our show. And I'd like to talk about, there has been a lot of, I do, I read voraciously. There has been a lot of issues raised in the Wall Street Journal and other places about what they perceive as a move of wealth from Main Street to corporate America and other places, which kind of leaves working families in the middle class out, very frankly. So having said that, I found it particularly interesting, interesting that uh, you have visited Ebensburg recently to talk about, I want to get it right, your Main Street Matters program. Now, you came there uh, bearing gifts of $25 million. Evansburg is a kind of a, I mentioned you about my Pittsburgh connections. I drive there back and forth all the time, and I go up, you know, 80 and then up 99 and bypass Altoona. And I know I'm getting close to Pittsburgh when I hit Evansburg at the top of that mm -hmm. hill. And uh, so that's always a welcome thing for me, uh, uh, seeing a sign for Evansburg, because I know I'm close to Pittsburgh now. But at any rate, obviously, it's an area in need of that. So talk about the initiative. I think it's a wonderful thing. And uh, again, we need to start redirecting wealth back to Main Street because here's the part that gets lost in the conversation, Governor. 60% of our gross national product comes from Main Street, not from the yep. giant corporations in Fortune 500, not from Wall Street, but from Main Street. So take it from there. Yeah, no, you know, the governor and I really are trying to jumpstart Pennsylvania's economy. We believe Pennsylvania can be a leader in uh, uh, economic growth, innovation. Uh, and so we are proposing uh, overall a $600 million ec expanded economic development investment program here in the state. And a part of that is $25 million uh, for our Main Streets Matters program, which, which will help rebuild Pennsylvania's Main Streets. Uh, we know no matter what community you go to in Pennsylvania, there's a Main Street. Uh, in Pennsylvania, many a lot of communities are older and have seen the loss of industry, and we have not invested in rebuilding those Main Streets. And so the governor and I uh, are directly uh, saying that we need to make investments to help make sure we're maintaining Main Streets that are already flourishing, but help Main Streets in communities that might be struggling. I'm from the Mon Valley region in Allegheny County. I grew up in McKeesport, was a state rep in McKeesport, Duquesne, Clareton, uh, communities that have been hard hit by the collapse of the steel industry, uh, but all have main streets and we're all struggling to keep them going. Um, and I, you know, in my time as a legislator, we were able to have some success in rebuilding and stabilizing some of those main streets. But I recognize the state needs to play a bigger role. They need to make a bigger investment in helping those communities succeed, helping those small businesses to expand. And if we do that, uh, we will see Pennsylvania's economy take off. And so the governor and I are thrilled about this program. I was in Evansburg touting uh, this program. I know the governor was out uh, in the southeastern part of the state. I think he was in Coatesville talking about this program. We're really excited uh, to help rebuild Pennsylvania's main streets. And look, we recognize this isn't a partisan issue. 
It's an issue that both Democrats and Republicans can agree on. You know, main streets are something that uh, everyone takes pride in. And so we we are we are taking the approach that we want to rebuild Pennsylvania's communities. Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk, especially at the federal level, about infrastructure. Uh, and, and too often that just gets lumped in with roads and bridges. And I understand that's a part of infrastructure. Well, not often mentioned as part of infrastructure is what you're talking about, the main streets. I mean, yeah. the main streets for the towns and boroughs, we have somewhere around, a little, I think, a little under 3,000 of them in Pennsylvania. And, you, you know, I know Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are included in there, and even scranton wilkes Bear is a larger metropolitan area in media market. But there's a lot of Pennsylvania out there. They call it the T, political uh, consultants. Yeah. But, you know, that is Main Street. The dairy farms are, are great farmlands and some great towns and in, in boroughs that are just wonderful places. Like, for example, uh, you know, another road trip of mine when I'm out west is, uh, is Ligonier. Ligonier yeah. has that little, you know, loop-de-loop -loop around, little old-fashioned from the 19th century, little town. It's not a town square. It's a town round with all stores and shops and courthouse. So there's a lot of that in Pennsylvania. It's gratifying to hear that uh, you're doing that. Governor, uh, now we're going to turn to the budget issue. Obviously, June 30th is coming up fast on all of us. I know you're, uh, as a partner with the governor, you are uh, shoulder to shoulder with him with your initiatives. Uh, I've had a very frank conversation with the speaker last week about what could get done from the legislative side. You have the unique experience of coming now from being a top executive you came from the legislative side in the House of Representatives, where my father served 50 years ago, by the way. So no. my family has roots that go way back to that body. But, you, you know, the elephant in the room right now is the uh, Commission uh, on Education that came up with the report. The Commonwealth Court said our school funding was unconstitutional. And obviously it's unfair and therefore it is. But they really left it open as to how much. So it took a year or so later for us to find out and the last number I heard that sounded real was about $5.4 billion with a B. And uh, to, to quote the speaker before I turn it over to you, you know, she kind of made the, uh, the reference that, well, how do you get this done? Because you don't have $5 billion in this budget that you can spend on education. And uh, she said, you know, one bite at a time, basically. <laughs> you know, yeah. That re reminded me of a joke, you know, how to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. So... Take it from there. Yeah, you know, I, I think the speaker is uh, exactly right. Look, we, we are in a very unique position here in Pennsylvania that the governor and I are the only governor and lieutenant governor in the country to preside over a divided legislature. Uh, we have a House controlled by Democrats and a Senate controlled by Republicans. Uh, and so in order to get anything done here, we're going to have to bring people together. And so, you know, we have the 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 court ruling uh, about the unconstitutionality of education funding here in the Commonwealth. We have begun to address that. Last year, the governor made the large the governor and I made the largest investment in public education in our Commonwealth history. Uh, we're proposing another historic investment this year in public education. Look, uh, we recognize we're not going to get there in one budget cycle. Uh, we're going to have to do this through multiple budget cycles where Democrats and Republicans are are going to come together. Uh, and I really feel good about the path that we are on, that we will get there. Um, but it is going to take a little bit of time. How about uh, now some of the other things, uh, you know, that you'd like to see get done that you think are doable in the budget? Um, you know, the Republicans in the Senate, especially earlier in this year, right after the governor's budget address, I had the Senate Majority Leader, Senator Joe Pittman, on the show talking from the Republican perspective. I was somewhat encouraged as a Pennsylvania taxpayer that it seemed like where with Governor Wolf for, for flat out for a bunch of years, it was dead on arrival. Like there was no, mm -hmm. there was yeah. no point that any, well, look, he be, Governor Wolf became the first governor in history in his first term to actually not sign a budget, any of them. that went in by operation of law. They were a bunch of stopgap measures, kind of like the feds do, but what else do you think there's bipartisan support that you'd like to see get done? Yeah, look, I think the economic development programs that we talked about earlier in the show is a bipartisan area. I think main streets, I think public safety, the money we're proposing for gun violence and uh, supporting law enforcement officers. I think that's another bipartisan area. 
You know, the governor and I also proposed historic funding for our, our mass transit systems here in Pennsylvania, from SEPTA to PRT, the system up uh, in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. I think that's uh, a, I think that's an area where Democrats and Republicans can come together because we recognize uh, our mass transit system is is critical, integral to keeping our economy moving from, you know, young people who are trying to get to work to seniors who are trying to get to doctor's appointments. I think that's an area where we can come together. I think, look, the, the, the Republicans have been debating that they think the governor and I's spend number is too large. Uh, we argue that, you know, we have $14 billion sitting in our rainy day fund in Harrisburg. Uh, we don't believe it's a badge of honor to take taxpayer money and to hide it away in a bank account in Harrisburg. We believe we should be investing in Pennsylvania, investing in our infrastructure, investing in main streets, investing in Pennsylvania families. Uh, and so, you know, there may be a little bit of a debate around what the final number is, but I feel really good that uh, we're going to be able to get to an agreement that uh, really helps move Pennsylvania forward. Well, that, that, that's well said, uh, Governor. Um, let's talk about on another area, because we've hit it pretty hard, but let's get a little bit more into your initiative about gun violence, because that's a special part. We kind of glossed over it away because we talked about recruitment of officers and the crime issues Pennsylvania faces. We hit that pretty well. But I know we mentioned it, but you have a special initiative and a special program, and you want funding for gun violence and, and gun violence prevention. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so so there's a number of programs. So in, uh, in our budget, we propose $100 million to take on gun violence. And there are a number of initiatives within that uh, within that $100 million that will be new to the state. One is setting up an o Office of Gun Violence Prevention here at the state level. Uh, we'll be the second state in the country uh, to create a, an office really focused on gun violence prevention here. Um, we'll be a leader uh, in that space. Uh, the other is just just uh, yesterday I was in Wilkes-Barre uh, with the governor and the district attorney up there and the mayor uh, announcing our uh, gun violence, our prosecution and law enforcement grant program for gun violence. Uh, we're proposing a, a little over $37 million to help prosecutors and law enforcement deal with gun crimes uh, uh, in the community. Uh, that's going to be a huge initiative, I think, that that will really help law enforcement take on the epidemic of gun violence. Uh, we propose $37.5 million to help fund uh, community-based programs that are working in the community to prevent uh, violence intervention. Uh, and also, you know, the after-school program. So all of those things are, are the initiative that I'm pushing, that I'm working on, uh, that the plan was crafted at uh, under my leadership at PCCD in the Lieutenant Governor's Office. Uh, and we presented it to the governor to get included in, in our budget because we really think this will make Pennsylvania community safer. Well, well, uh, Sam Sangaldochi is a very good friend of mine. He's a, a very, a very effective prosecutor. Uh, I know the people of Luzerne County sleep safer with him uh, having, the, as they say, the keys to the jail. One of the things that I think falls uh, not directly under your jurisdiction, but kind of uh, being lieutenant governor, uh, back in the day when I was actually running, uh, the, the guy that beat me and, and others in the primary was acting governor at the time, Mark Single. He had been lieutenant governor and Governor Casey famously underwent his double transplant. But uh, one of the issues I kind of learned fr about from him was he sat as chairman of the parole board. So, board of pardons. Bo uh, board of pardons, thank you. Um, one of the things that I talked about with the speaker last week, I thought it was a wonderful idea. I'd like your comment. She made a very eloquent case that people that have been convicted of, let's say, minor crimes, nonviolent crimes, things of that nature, uh, for example, small amounts of, let's say, marijuana or whatever, uh, that, that that record makes it very difficult for them when they get paroled to get a job, to get yeah. into school, to do anything oh. because they have a criminal record. And her, her initiative, what she talked about, is something she's pushing in the House but as I said, it's not directly under your jurisdiction, but kind of as your chairman of the Board of Pardons and as lieutenant governor, uh, that I thought it was a great idea because yeah. they can't buy a home. I mean, one of, our, our, you know, one of the issues with first time home ownership, well, I had that, you know, I did something dumb when I was in college and, it, and that record yeah. trails me. So talk a little bit about that. I think it's a great initiative. Yeah, you know, she's been she's been a huge leader and we've supported a number of the things that she's been doing in the legislature. 
look, Pennsylvania should be a place for second chances. And, and we shouldn't judge people uh, on a decision that they made on their worst day. Uh, many folks in Pennsylvania have worked hard uh, from making a mistake to become law-abiding citizens to turn their lives around and lead productive lives. Uh, and we should reward them with a second chance. Uh, as the chairman of the Board of Pardons, we've done a lot of work to try to streamline the process to make it more efficient, to make it so that second chances will come sooner. Uh, we've doubled the staff at the Board of Pardons. We've expanded uh, the resources that they have to make sure that they can carry a bigger volume of, of, of caseload. The Board of Pardons now is meeting more than it's ever met before. We meet every month where they used to meet quarterly. Uh, and so, you know, we're working really hard uh, under the leadership of the governor and Speaker McClinton and, and myself to really make sure that Pennsylvanians who are deserving have the opportunity to get a second chance. Um, because not only will it help them change their lives, it'll help their economy, it'll help it'll help the economy, it'll help deal with the workforce challenges that we have uh, here in, the, in this Commonwealth. And so uh, that's something that we've been we've been pushing for a lot uh, in that role. And, and, and I, one of the other areas I talk with her that I at least want to get your take on it, I, I have to say, you, you know, I'm a conservative. I was a conservative Democrat. I spent a short time as a Republican. Now I'm an independent. I think I finally found my, my niche because I find myself agreeing with, with a bunch of Democratic proposals and a, and a bunch of Republican proposals. I was always kind of a hybrid going back. But, you know, a, a, another area uh, for me, that uh, we talked about, which again, coming from a Democrat is, I'm thrilled to hear, but she was very uh, uh, much talking about the, the earned income tax credit, expanding that, and then segueing right into raising the minimum wage. You know, two mm -hmm. things that, that are very near and dear. I'm sure they're big issues for you. And I said, like, even though I'm a conservative, 7.25, $7 is not only the lowest in the Northeastern United States, it's the lowest of all our contiguous states. Yeah. And, and, you know, I understand, like, my problem is, Governor, that I understand the argument that $15 is too much. But what about the $8 in between? That, yeah. That should there's, a be. Lot of, there's a lot of delta. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of space to reach an agreement between, you know, if, if folks don't want to go to 15, between 725, I mean, you know, like 13. But look, the reality is nobody's paying 725 either. I mean, so like, you know, you can't 725 is just it's a poverty wage right. uh, in, in this uh, in this in this environment, in this economy. Right. Uh, and so you're 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 you almost are incentivizing people not to work with a minimum wage that low. Right. Uh, so, you know, we, we really it's it's beyond time. West Virginia, I think, is beating us on on minimum wage. That here. says a lot uh, in, in Pennsylvania. And so. I think it's past time that we get this done. I mean, you know, really for the sake of our economy, for the sake of working class Pennsylvanians who are, who are just trying to provide for themselves and their families that, that we really need to do it. I co-sponsored the $15 minimum wage bill when I was in the legislature. The governor and I have called for it. Uh, but like we'd ask Senate Republicans, if they don't like it, come to us with a number. <laughs> <laughs> I understand 15 is a dead on arrival, but but that shouldn't mean a 10. How about nine? Yeah. You know, something. Yes. something, something is better than nothing. And so we, we, we are open to those conversations. And I hope I hope uh, that that can be a part of the budget package that, that we do uh, as we go into June. No doubt. Well, uh, believe it or not, our half hour has blown through, uh, Lieutenant Governor. I very much, again, appreciate your taking the time. As I say to uh, a number of my guests, I hope we uh, can have the right to call you back after the budget process to talk about what made it, what didn't. And as I say to our top elected officials, whenever you want to speak to Northeastern Central Pennsylvania, you'll be uh, welcome on this show and uh, you'll have a half hour on Fox every Sunday morning. We're the lead into NFL Sunday football, by the way. We have a pretty okay. good time slot. So uh, whenever you want to come back, uh, you're welcome. I will be back and we'll do I'll be with you in studio. We'll do it in studio at some point. Well, when you're in the Northeast, I look forward to meeting you personally, Governor. Thank you. All right. Take care.